Chapter Zero, The Innisfree Tunnels Toll stopped and looked around the observatory until he spotted Darling. Drinks, he asked. Afternoon tea, maybe? Darling leapt up and fussed, her little body shedding a few pink feathers. Oh, my dear boy, she said, I'm so sorry. Of course, I have a feast ready for you. Some of the time fairies and I prepared all morning. Come into the observatory, everyone. It's all waiting for you. Darling flew into the observatory and lifted lids from huge salads, covers from a vast array of cakes, and arranged other delicacies onto plates so that no one would miss out. Time fairies flew about serving juices and hot chocolates and giving little kisses to anyone who wanted one. There was a hum of conversation and everyone talked about the story and how good it was and how much they wished they could visit Dragolin. There was a sudden trumpet fanfare and everyone looked up. Angel appeared with Magal. We have some more special guests, said Angel, gesturing towards the huge doors of the observatory. There stood Nell and Bill Dew with Tilly, their daughter, who was about a year older than Skye and Minnow. Tilly had blonde hair like her brothers and it too was messy. Her eyes looked blue sometimes and other times they were grey. She smiled at everyone, but she was clearly looking for her brothers. When she spotted Toll, she ran over to him. Toll, she said loudly, squealing with delight and hugging him. I missed you so much. Toll laughed and hugged her back. Jax embraced Tilly as well and said, You've grown. Good work. Are you going to study the physics of enchantment finally? I hope so, said Tilly. I love science, so all I need to do now is add in the magic. Jax grinned. Perfect, she said. Once the afternoon tea had ended, Magal invited everyone to move back onto the huge deck outside the observatory. Now the whole Dew family is here, he said, so I'm going to let you all in on a secret. This family is the offspring of Elsie Dew, who invented the indigo sea for all of us to enjoy. There was a loud cheer. And so should we cheer, said Nagal. We owe so much to the indigo sea. It certainly looked after me for many a century. So in honour of all that, I'm going to ask Bill Dew to read the next part of our story. Bill is a toy maker and believe me, he creates the most wonderful toys in the universe. Bill, would you mind reading us some of the story Toll and Jax have written? I think you'll find it's about a time you'll remember well. Bill walked out in front of everyone and took the manuscript from Toll. Jax waved her hands in front of Bill and a chair full of holographic toys appeared. Bill sat down and rearranged the toys before hugging a very happy-looking teddy bear and then settling in next to him to read. Here goes, he said, and the story continued. Chapter Zero, The Innisfree Tunnels Some of the Jews' friends questioned the wisdom of letting their boys venture underneath the earth so often, but Nell and Bill Dew had always been risk-takers, and they didn't want to quench that spirit in their sons. They'd equipped them with head torches, lit shoes and enchanted jackets. Bill had made all the gear in his toy shop, so they could see in the dark and stay in touch with the world above. Their lights were fail-safe and their jackets enabled telepathy to be crystal clear no matter how deep, deep down they were. The boys' tunnelling project fit with the Dragolin system of learning which was free and easy. The lack of rules was a perfect fit for Solo and Toll. Their cousins lived in Kingsland and had to go to boarding schools but the Dew family thought that Dragolin's ideas about imagination and magic for children were way better. Dragolin had used the, the imagineering style of education for more than two centuries. Solo hoped that boarding schools would never come back. He'd seen movies about schools that were like factories with children being bullied by bored students or drilled with weird information by equally bored teachers. He thought it looked horrible. Every second night, Solo, Toll and Tilly used a magic dreaming pillow to help them learn about a new topic, and most days they worked on knowledge explorations. 
Besides that, the boys had their tunnel project and all of it was overseen by their parents and the children's mentor, Decker Bandit, a musician who was very wise. The children met with Decker once a fortnight to report on their progress and to discuss any discoveries they'd made. The Jew children wouldn't have it any other way. The following day, the boys met at the fountain well after their morning chores. Solo got there first and after a few minutes he heard the purr of Toll's bike coming through the concrete underpass. Toll's tyres screeched as he crashed through the bushes and almost landed right on top of his brother. Excellent, said Solo with a grin. Come on, I just saw some strange kids. I don't want to let them get away. They went into the fountain well tunnel. Leaving their bikes in a secret place, Solo and Toll ducked their heads to miss the iron grating at the entrance of the tunnel. They were fully kitted with their tunnel gear. Under the ground it was so dark that the boys un under the ground it was dark, but the boys could see clearly. Who were they? asked who who were the kids? asked Toll. don't know, said Solo. The tunnel kids? Toll laughed. Maybe they're abandoned, said Solo. The ones Asmax told Mum about. I didn't hear her say anything, said Toll. She asked Mum to look out for one of the dads, said Solo. Can't remember his name, but he's in some sort of trouble. Maybe the kids aren't abandoned, said Toll. Who knows, said Solo. Toll nodded. What sort of parents leaves their kids behind? Solo shrugged. Dunno, he said. There were heaps of passageways, so the boys agreed to split up. Solo was beside himself with excitement. Finally, something was happening. Solo went into the widest tunnels, whilst, while Toll went into the secret passageways where he was less likely to be noticed. That's, this suited Toll, who felt that he wasn't quite as brave as Solo. The boys stayed in touch via telepathy. After about five minutes, Solo closed his eyes and imagined a silent message to Toll. Can you see anyone yet? No, replied Toll as he crept quietly through one of the back tunnels. He was fairly certain that no one else had been that way because there weren't any footprints in the slimy mud. The air was still and dank and all Toll could see were tiny footprints left by kanger mice. Well, I think we'll call them tiny scrabbling marks. Tiny scrabbling marks left by kanger mice. Toll felt glad there wasn't any evidence of human activity. As much as he yearned for adventure, he wasn't sure that he really wanted it. He wasn't sure that he really wanted it, especially if it included danger. And somehow that morning, he felt as if danger wouldn't mind having him for lunch. Just then, right when he was thinking about danger, some glowing words appeared all over his clothes and also on the tunnel walls. The words were a golden colour and they read, You're safe. He'd never seen anything like it before. Brushing his clothes, he tried to make the words disappear, but his hands went straight through the words. A golden vapour began, began to surround him and Toll felt as if someone had wrapped him in a heavy cloak. As he stood breathing, he was amazed to find that he felt really protected. Standing inside the safety of his golden word cloak, Toll felt just fine. He was starting to really relax when he heard something that sent a chill along his spine. It felt as if a cold breeze had entered the tunnel, but there wasn't... Re it, it, it felt as if a cold breeze had entered the tunnel, but there wasn't really a breeze. Whatever it was caused every muscle in his body to tense up. Hearing the dull murmur of children's voices, Toll began to relax again. Then he stopped breathing and listened harder. Yep, it was definitely kids. Toll quickly telepathed Solo. I'm in the furthest tunnel, back near the rivulet, and I can hear voices. We'll try to get closer.